Hey, good morning, Journey. Everybody feeling good today? Man, I just, um, first off, my name is Adam, and I'm the lead pastor here. If you're new, if we haven't met, I'd love to meet you. Just come up after service, introduce yourself. Uh, we are in a new series uh, this week. Uh, well, actually, we started it last week. We're in a new series, and um, I believe the Lord just really is working in this. I could just tell this morning just with the worship that what was said, what was sung, what was even talked about is really a confirmation of the word that the God has really given us today. Um, we're in a series called Supernatural Building, it's second week, and we're talking about Nehemiah building the walls of Jerusalem, which only really happened supernaturally in just 52 days. It's impossible for Nehemiah to do that on his own, to organize it all, but he did it. He did it through God's favor and God's help. And last week we prayed the powerful prayer, God break my heart for what breaks yours. How many know we need the heart of God? To be effective as a church, to be effective in our calling personally, we need the heart of God in our life. And we said this, we said that in every season of life we need to worship, in every season of life we need to ask God to search us, in every season of life we need to stand on his promises. And this week's message is really building off of that. Because there is no way that we're gonna receive the favor of God, which is what we're talking about this morning, without those three things. The reason why Nehemiah had the favor of God on his life, but ultimately gave him the favor of the king, is because he positioned his heart like that. And that's what we're really talking about this morning. Let's read our text together, uh, Nehemiah chapter two. It says this, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Remember, this is taking place in Persia, present-day Iraq, and he's about to request uh, to the king to go to Jerusalem build, to rebuild the walls. This is Nehemiah. When wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. So part of his job as a cupbearer is to maintain his countenance. He wasn't allowed to, to show any emotion because he didn't want to cloud. And so uh, he says this, therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you were not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of your heart. So in that moment, he became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. So he's trying to make up for his countenance in that, in that moment. Why should my face not be sad? He says, when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and his gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, he prays a quick prayer under his breath. So I pray to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor, say favor, church. Come on, say favor. If your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask you that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let the letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. Just notice the favor right here that Nehemiah has. Verse eight, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make the beasts of the citadel which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. God's hand was upon Nehemiah. It was upon Nehemiah. Can you say that's favor? Come on, say that's favor. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sambalot and Hornite, uh, the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite officially heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. And we talk about those two individuals later in our series, but this morning we're talking about the favor of the king. I've entitled my message today, The Favor of the King. 
favor of the king. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the number that is on the screen and my notes will uh, be sent to you. Let's pray. Let's just ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. God, we, uh, we come humbly before you. We come humbly before you, King of kings and Lord of lords. As children of God, as heirs of the kingdom of God. And Lord, we ask today that, Lord, you would make your Logos word become alive in us. That, God, it would become rhema to us. Lord, I literally cannot do this without you. Lord, I feel a weight this morning with this word. God, I know it is timely. I know this is what you are speaking to us right now in this season of this church, in the season of us as in our personal lives, God. And Lord, I pray that your words would be my words, God. Lord, we open our hearts to you today and we say to you this morning, Lord, speak to us, God, for your servants are listening. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit desperately right now in this hour that we live. Lord, remove any pride, remove any arrogance, God. Lord, I'm not here to please man, but I'm only here to please you today. Help my heart, God. We desire you alone. So God, we say to you this morning, God, let us recognize the favor that we have as children of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. How many um, people are foodies in here? You love food, I mean, come on. I am a foodie, like I love to eat good food and when I'm eating good food, I want everybody at the table around me (laughs) to share in what I'm eating. So uh, Laura and I will will go on a date and you know, when you go on a date, you go to a nice restaurant, so nine times out of 10, you'll get a, a good meal. And so, you know, I'll order off the menu, of course, what I believe is gonna be the best meal and Laura will do the same. And typically my meal is always better than hers in my opinion, it just kind of ends up that way, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I'll ask, I'll take one bite and I'm like, Laura, this is heavenly, like this is so good. Like Laura, you have got to taste this food. Like have a bite and I'll offer a bite. She goes, You're, any, any husbands out there like this? And, and she'll say, no thanks, I, I don't, I don't want to try it. I'll, I'll eat my food right now. And then halfway through, I'll ask her again, hey, hey Laura, please, this food, the food really is, it really is super, super good. Like you've got to try this right now. And she's like, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, Rad. I'm really, I'm just, I'm just, we're sitting here and we're just doing it. I'm, and so I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So, you know, you know, I have two bites left and I'm gonna give it one last attempt, but of course the last bite is mine. Am I not like this, Laura? <laughs> the last bite is mine and I'm asking her, uh, okay, I've got two bites. I, I'm thinking this in my head. Uh, Laura, just try this before I eat it all. Like for real, it is really, 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 really good. You've got to try this. It is so good. Because I want to share in what I am tasting. Like it's amazing. So I'm like, please. And she denies me again. Like, no, I don't want to eat it. I'm, I'm good. And I'm like, okay. Like, it, but isn't that an incredible job if you really to think about it? Like if you were to have a job like that where you to taste food and be like, hey, this is really great. This is my stamp of approval. Like, and you were doing that as a job. Now, just imagine, that's like a dream job to do that for a boss, isn't it? Like to taste food, to make sure it's good. Uh, Nehemiah, he, his, his job is somewhat like this. He would taste the food, he would taste the wine, make sure that it was good, give it a stamp of approval and be like, okay, king, like I approve of this, you've gotta try this, it's for, your, it's for his court, his royal, his royal court, you've gotta try, it. like this is my approval over this wine, over this food. But the only caveat to this job, even though it's a dream job, is this, that you have to try it as well to make sure there wasn't even po- any poison at all. So he's trying to like, Lord, like I pray right now, I'm not gonna die from this, I know there's potential, there's poison, this is really good food, but you know. So this is a cupbearer's job. This is Nehemiah's job, he's a cupbearer. He tries the best, make sure there's no poison for the king. But also along with this job is uh, 
he has the favor of the king as far as he's able to uh, ask for, his king would ask him his opinion about things. He was a close confidant, all that stuff. Like he was in the royal court. But was, what was unheard of, though, is a cupbearer to be able to go and to do something like Nehemiah where he's going to go rebuild a city. Because he's basically stuck there for the remainder of his life. Like it is unheard of for him to be able to have this type of favor to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it was only the favor of God that gave him the ability to go do this. Now there's a difference between luck, right? And there's a difference between favor. I want to give you the definition of luck. Luck is this. Luck is when success or failure is apparently brought by chance rather through one's own actions. So it's in the Hail Mary in the end zone right at the very end. It's the winning lotto ticket, right? It's winning your fantasy football league because I haven't won it in like seven years, so it's definitely not skill. It's luck if you win your fantasy football league. It's luck is, is hitting a hole-in-one in golf. Like, uh, it, there's some skill involved, but it is lucky unless you're Dennis Posey. I'm not sure if he's here. He hit a hole-in-one recently. Like, there's some luck and some skill involved. There he is right there. It is luck. So luck is by chance. But let me read you the definition of favor. Favor, or to find favor, means to receive the attention and respect of another. To receive the attention and respect of another. Nehemiah finds favor with the king because he had favor with who? He had favor with the king of kings. What does this favor look like for us? Ephesians 2. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. This is the kind of favor, church, reserved for those who give their lives to Christ and for those who are obedient to him. What happens is the impossible becomes possible. It's possible because the favor of the king that rests on his children. This is why Nehemiah heard these words in verse 8 from the king of Persia, whom he was a cupbearer for. And the king granted them to me according to, according to what? Read it out loud. To the good hand of my God upon me. Was it, was it, was it favor because Nehemiah was so great or so awesome or so incredible? No, it was favor because, the God, like get this, the God of the universe, the one who controls everything, sees it all, knows everything, like put the stars in the sky. Like Isaiah says, he measures the waters in the cup of his hands. He measures the sky with a nine-inch span, meaning from his thumb to his pinky. Like this God has this type of favor. So don't you think if this, if this type of God has the favor over Nehemiah as a child of God, that he can have a favor over a king and he can, he can tell kings of this world what to do? Because of that God having favor on his life. You see, the king of kings, our father in heaven, gives us favor just like Nehemiah. Ruth found favor in the eyes of Boaz. Hannah found favor in the eyes of Eli. Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar. Esther found favor in the eyes of King Xerxes. You see, every power and principality is under the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Every fiery dart, everything that the enemy throws at us is under the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Church. The kind of favor, this kind of favor rests on his children. I want you to understand something this morning. Romans 8, 12, it talks about the inheritance and the unmerited favor as children of God. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How many Christians are just walking around defeated all the time, not understanding who their father really is? 
We can be a Christian and walk around in defeat because we're not understanding and walking in knowing that we are children of God and we are not a slave to sin. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we crowd up a father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, I love this, and if if we are children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Church, we have the favor of of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords in our life. No longer are we slaves. But we are adopted into the family of God. We're children of God. We're children of the Most High God. We are heirs of his kingdom. So I wanna give you three things this morning about this passage in Romans and look at the story of Nehemiah. Here's, Here's number one this morning. We have the favor of the king to no longer live in bondage. We have the favor of the king to no longer live in bondage. This favor is for us to no longer live as slaves, but live as sons and daughters of God. We can live according to the spirit that lives within us with no longer having to just accept the sins in our life or the bondage in our life. We can turn from it and listen to the Holy Spirit's leading. I want to read this passage again, verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We are not a slave to fear. We are not a slave to our sin. We are not a slave to what others have said about us. We are not a slave to the struggles of this world because of what Christ did on the cross for us, because of the redemption of our sins and that he rose again on the third day and he restored right relationship with our Father and he has now not made us slaves, but he has made us sons and daughters of God, heirs of the kingdom of God. Because of that, no matter what you are going through today, Jesus is enough. I'm telling you, no matter what your marriage is at right now, no matter what the relationship might be, Jesus is enough. No matter what someone has said about you, Jesus is enough. No matter what you are currently going through with the weight of this world, I'm telling you, church, Jesus is enough. What he did on Calvary is enough for you to overcome every obstacle, every situation, no matter what you're facing. It is time for the church to stop burying our heads and begin to not walk in bondage, but walk as heirs and sons of God. We are not bound and enslaved to sin anymore, but we are free to walk in the freedom of what God has given us. Jesus is enough. Our Father is enough. Say, I'm a son and daughter of God, or whichever one you are. <laughs> we are sons and daughters of God. And thank you, Jesus. <laughs> He's enough for you to overcome sin and the weight of this world and the feeling of this world. And so many of you are just walking around with this heaviness. You're walking around with some guilt. You're walking around with some shame in your life. You're in a place where you're like, Lord, there's just so much coming at me, and I just don't know how to handle all this. I'm telling you, it's an invitation to run to the feet of Jesus, your Father in heaven, and he wants to wrap his arms around you with intimacy and love on you. It is that invitation in those moments to do that. What a privilege it is to run to a Father who is our strong tower. Which leads me to point two this morning. We have the favor of the king to walk in confidence. We have the favor of the king to walk in confidence. You know, Caleb, he uh, he's uh, played basketball for a couple for a couple years now, and at the Y, and 
uh, about a year ago, he was on a team that was absolutely awful. I mean, they lost, literally, it seemed like uh, they lost every, every game. <laughs> and uh, it, just, it, just, it just was not a good season for him. But the, but the last game, there was something about that game where the last game, the coach was like, all right, team, like, this is the last game. You guys just go for it, encouraging them, like, instilling in them this confidence. And the entire season, Caleb was, like, passing the ball to other people. When he had a wide-open shot, he would he'd literally pass it. He wouldn't take the shot. Like, he, he was good, but he didn't really have the confidence to go do it because he felt like he needed to, to pass it to his teammates. In the last game of the season, the coach just said, Caleb, you can dribble the ball. Caleb, you can actually shoot the ball. And what happened that last game was he scored 12 points, which was more than his entire team scored the, in, the entire season. Like... He just had something, like there's a switch that turned on in him because the coach gave him this confidence. What I love about this story in Nehemiah is that the king gave Nehemiah confidence. How did he give him confidence? Because the king literally gave him an army to be sent with him. Watch this. I love this. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Just think about it. So everything, while Nehemiah was going on his journey, while he was going to Jerusalem and he was encountering these problems, which we're going to talk about, he had an army behind him. Wouldn't that give you some confidence instead of just going by yourself that you have an army behind you, a powerful Persian army? Listen, as kings, I'm sorry, as sons and daughters of the king of kings, we literally have an army behind us. Do you understand? Listen to this. Psalm 91, 11, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Hebrews 1, 14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? Listen. The God of angel armies is behind you. Come on, try over here. The God of angel armies is literally behind you. There are moments and there's times where we feel like the runt that's on the playground and there's all these bullies coming at us and they're trying to beat us up and we're scared. But what we don't realize is there is a dad behind us who's stronger than anything else. And he's right there standing behind us and he's our defender, he's our strong tower, he's our ever-present help in time of need. He is the God of angel armies and he has sent them to be charged over you. You're feeling like you're getting beat up, but you don't realize God the Father is literally right behind you. He is there for you. His angels are there. That gives us confidence. Shouldn't that give you confidence realizing literally God is fighting your battles? We don't have to do it ourselves. Our confidence, church, is not in ourselves, our own abilities, what God has given us. Our confidence can never be in us. What is it in? It's knowing that Man, there's a strong dad, right, literally right behind me. I'm not a runt on the playground about to get beat up by bullies, but literally God is right behind me, and his angels are putting charge over me. And this God who loves you so much is right behind you, and he is cheering you on. He's saying, go, 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 go. Fulfill your destiny. Fulfill your call. Do it knowing that I am right behind you, and I have given you tools. I have given you the ability to go do it, and he is cheering you on. Man, when, I, when my kids first started playing soccer, I would, I would literally, I would walk and pace down the soccer field as my kids were kicking the ball, like literally cheering them on. At one point, my wife was like, Adam, you're embarrassed me, you you just got to stop, like sit down, quit doing that. Like that was the dad that I am. I don't do that anymore. But literally, God hasn't lost that passion for us as children of God. Like he's literally cheering us on, like go, run the race. There might be tribulation, there might be difficulties, because in this life, we're not promised for things to be easy. But what is happening is that when the enemy is coming and he's attacking and he's doing things and there's difficulties, listen, he is, he is, he is teaching us in that moment and making us stronger for his glory. Why are we building for him? We are building for him and nothing else. That is why we are building, right? And our our God, our Father in heaven is literally cheering us on. Recognize you're a son and daughter of the most high God. You are heirs of the kingdom of God. He is behind you. He is for you. We sing it this morning. 
I want to encourage you right now with some scripture today. We need to hear this. This is so good. Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Psalm 34, 4 through 5, 8, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, God, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong, church. Be courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Romans 5 15 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy. Fill you with all joy in every situation. May he the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 41, 13, for I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Psalm 27, 3, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war breaks out against me. Even then, I will be confident. Say, I will be confident. Come on, say, I will be confident. confident. Two more verses. Romans 8.31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Jeremiah 119, they will fight against you but will not overcome you. For I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Come on, God is fighting for us. We talked about last week about standing on the promises of God. We can stand on the promises of God. This is scripture. This is the promises that we stand on in every season. These are the promises of sons and daughters of God. We can be confident. We can be confident no matter what storm you might face, no matter where your marriage might be at. No matter what trial at work you're going through, no matter what relationship seems hopeless, we can be confident that God is fighting for us. And if God is fighting for us, who can be against us? Number three this morning, we have the favor of the king to build for his glory. We have the favor of the king to build for his glory. You know, I... Um, I I'm terrible at fixing things. Like I'm not a, we made a joke this past week about not being a handyman on one of this Facebook, Facebook thing. But uh, I, I just can't, I'm not good at that stuff. And, um, but I do know this. I, knew, I do know that the right tool is incredibly important, right? So when I first moved into my house, we have these huge oak trees everywhere. And uh, man, there was just leaves everywhere. But my last house, I had this battery powered leaf blower. So I'd get up there blowing the leaves and there was just like leaves everywhere. And I'm like, this is only meant for a patio. This is not working. Like I, I, can't, I can't do this. So I asked Jeff Eads, many of you know Jeff Eads. I asked him, like, hey dude, like what's the best um, blower I can possibly get? And he said, uh, get this, get, get a back, Ryobi backpack blower, it's at Home Depot. So I went after church that day, uh, picked it up. And I blow off my leaves, that, that, and I was like, wow, this thing really works. Like, this is so much better. How many know the tools that we use are really matter, right? The tools that we use really matter. Nehemiah was given tools for his journey. Look at this. Nehemiah 2, in a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates and the citadel which pertains to the temple for the city walls and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Nehemiah was given the tools to rebuild the walls. What tools has God given us? Because we've kind of said this a lot here, but our weapons are warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. We're not, our tools that God's given us are not earthly tools. We don't, we don't fight the enemy with a closed fist. What do we do? We fight the enemy with our worship, with our prayer. 
I want to give you seven things right now, seven practical things of tools, of weapons that God has given us in this fight and in this battle that we are having. Because First Peter talks about how the enemy is literally going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He, the enemy is not for you. If you allow him to get in, he's going to get in. He's going to wreak havoc. He's going to do the damage that he possibly, all the damage he possibly can. Here's seven tools very quickly. Number one, we talk about, we, we repeat this all the time, the word of God. The word of God is a tool for you. Ephesians 6, 17, God's given us the word of the spirit, which is the word of God. The second tool God's given us is prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with prayer and supplication. The third tool God's given us is worship. You know, in the Old Testament, God would command the armies to send out the worshipers first. And because he sent out the worshipers, he would give them the battle. If they were obedient, send out the worshipers first, which in the natural doesn't make any sense at all when you're encountering a situation. When, he would, when he, they would send that out, God would give them the battle. I mean, if you live your life for these first three things, we talk about it a lot. Uh, worship, prayer, and in the word. If you do this on a daily basis, your life's going to be turned upside down. The fourth tool that God gives us is simply just the name of Jesus. If you don't know what to do, just speak the name of Jesus. There's power in his name, Philippians 2.10. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord of all. Speak the name of Jesus. The fifth tool is fasting. Isaiah 58.6, is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? The sixth tool he's given us, weapon he's given us, is our testimony. Revelation 12.11, and they overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. The last thing, number seven, thanksgiving. Did you know that thanksgiving Declaring, declaring thanks to God, that's literally a weapon that you can use in the arsenal against the attacks of the enemy. It's literally a weapon. When my kids are in a, in a fight, Laura and I will often ask them, hey, say something really nice about each other right now. Like, hey, begin to thank uh, God for one another right now. And what happens is it just changes their whole attitude. Thanksgiving is a weapon we can use be anxious for nothing, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Aren't you thankful that you're a son and daughter of God? That he has called you his own. That you are heirs of the kingdom of heaven. That no weapon formed against you shall prosper when you understand who you are in Christ. But we've got to walk in obedience. We've got to do our part. We've got to do much more than just get to heaven. We've got to fervently seek after the Lord. And then we find the favor of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Just to recap this morning, we have the favor of the King to no longer live in bondage. We have the favor of the King to walk in confidence. And we have the favor of the King to build for his glory. Would you stand and rise with me? Lord, we want to build for your glory. Lord, not for our own.